I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. A beloved single mother of two is a no-show at work. What time was she supposed to be at work? Eight o'clock. Something's wrong. Police are dispatched to her house and walk in on a horrible discovery. She's laying in this giant pool of blood. She's been brutally beaten, stabbed, and left for dead. I was just in shock. It was the worst crime scene that I'd ever been involved in. The only thing I could really recognize on her was her hands. Not an enemy in the world. Who would want to kill Marty Hill? No sexual assault. There wasn't a robbery. A former lover, a suspicious handyman. And then something miraculous happens. Marty wakes up. You are an inspiration. Today, her incredible survivor story, was she able to identify her attacker? And I kept saying, why? What are you doing? Then a Houston police officer. I was in the best shape of my life. Gets a crushing diagnosis. I tell me I have full-blown stage four cancer. But when Hurricane Harvey hits, nothing can stop him from the call of duty. You yourself aren't safe, but you're still moving forward and helping others. Today, we surprise him with our badge of honor. We have a special honor for you right now. Go, let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? <laughs> Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. Oftentimes, we let people into our homes with very little thought that maybe the person we're opening our door to could be hiding deadly intentions. Our Michelle Sagona is in Kansas City now with today's story, The Devil You Know. Chris, when Marty Hill failed to show up for work, panicked coworkers contacted police to check to see if everything was okay. But when authorities arrived here at this home, they weren't prepared for what they would find. Bludgeoned in her basement and left to die. He strangled her, he pounded her head into the concrete, and then he cut her throat on both sides. Marty Hill was found so badly beaten, her own children couldn't recognize her. It didn't look like her. It didn't. And the only thing I could really recognize on her was her hands. But who would want to kill the single mother and why? Did you know if she had any enemies? Oh, never. I can't even imagine in a million years that someone would. A real whodunit that left one quiet Kansas community living in fear. It was very much not your normal crime that takes place in Prairie Village, Kansas. Marty Hill loved her job as a graphic artist for an apparel company in Overland Park, Kansas, and her co-workers loved her. Good person, good heart, hard worker, just someone you want to be around. The single mother of two rarely took a day off and was never late getting to the office. Very reliable. That's probably the best word to describe her. She was a, a hard worker. She implemented that in, in me and my sister as well. So one morning when Marty wasn't in the office by her usual 8 a.m., then missed a weekly operations meeting two hours later, everyone took notice. They didn't even really end up having the meeting. They just kind of started talking about how she hadn't shown up. And we worked so closely together that she would have told me that she wasn't going to be there. But Marty hadn't told anyone she wouldn't be at work that day. When they tried calling and texting, they got no answer. Your gut instinct is telling you something's wrong. Something's wrong. Was there panic in the office? We were all remained pretty calm, um, but we thought that we, something needed to be done. So Marty's boss drove to her house in nearby Prairie Village. He immediately notices her SUV parked in the driveway. But there was no sign of Marty. He knocks on the door, no answer, kind of walked around the house, didn't see anything suspicious. When everyone at the office heard Marty's truck was there, but she wouldn't answer the door, they called police. We were wondering if somebody could drive by and do a welfare check on her. Okay, so she lives by herself? Yes. Her daughter lives there part-time, but she's in high school. We didn't want to call and alarm her. What time was she supposed to be at work? Eight o'clock. She just never misses without it telling us. Okay, well, we'll check and um, we'll give you a call back if we need somebody. Nobody has a key or anything there, do they? No, we sure don't. The Kansas neighborhood Marty called home 
was known for its quiet, safe streets. Get very few calls in that, that area. The calls we do get typically are of the property crime type. Around midday on a Wednesday, Officer Bill Baldwin answered the call to check on a woman who hadn't shown up for work. You arrive on the scene here. Yes. What's the first thing you do? I went to the front door and knocked. Uh, I didn't receive any kind of answer. He then walked around the outside of the house, looking through windows to see if anybody was home. At what point do you start to make entry into the house? Uh, when I realized uh, that the front door had been unlocked. Once inside, the officer immediately noticed something suspicious. I first noticed that there was a woman's purse sitting on the kitchen dining room table. Her car's out front, her purse is on the table, the house is quiet, and there's still no signs of her, but you, you think that she's probably close. Yes, I believe she's probably close at this point. Officer Baldwin searched every room on the first level, then found stairs leading to a basement and started making his way down. Is it dark? It's very dark and I'm, I've got a flashlight uh, and I'm announcing my presence the entire time. I don't want to scare anybody that actually lives there. Before reaching the bottom of the stairs, he noticed blood on the floor, then spotted someone lying nearby. I don't know this is Marty for sure at this point, but it's it appears to be a female subject and she's laying in this giant pool of blood um, facing away from the stairs in kind of a fetal position. It had to be difficult for you to see someone like that. It's a little unnerving, it, to say the least. Officer Baldwin wasn't sure if she was dead or alive. I could not feel a pulse. But then she turned towards him, revealing her extensive injuries. Her face what looked extremely swollen. Her hair was just soaked in blood. I looked down a little further and then I saw the cutting on her throat. Covered in blood from head to toe and unable to speak, Officer Baldwin still wasn't certain this was Marty Hill. Paramedics arrived and rushed the woman to the hospital. Sergeant Luke Roth rode along in the ambulance. I'll be honest with you, she was covered in blood to the point I did not know what race she was. Oh my gosh. I thought she was a black female until she got cleaned up for surgery. And I mean, that's how dry the blood was. On the way to the hospital, he was hoping Marty could provide some sort of clues to what had happened. We were trying to get what you would call a dying declaration, some sort of statement as to who did this, and we were unable to ever get any response from her. One of Marty's co-workers who had returned to the house delivered the terrible news to the office. The only thing she said to us was there's a lot of blood. And that's all that she said. That had to be terrifying. It was terrifying because we didn't know if she was dead or alive at that point. When paramedics reached the hospital, doctors declared Marty a level one trauma patient. My mom had very deep lacerations on her throat. She also had multiple skull fractures. Her chances of surviving, not good. Detectives knew it was unlikely that Marty Hill would be able to help them find the person who'd beat, stabbed, and left her to die. They had a personal reason for the extent of injuries that she suffered. But who would want to kill Marty Hill? And were they done trying? There was concern on the family's part. Could they come to the hospital? And try to make sure Correct. she's dead. Correct. Up next, the search for suspects that leads to a familiar face. I didn't understand why my dad would have been a suspect. And a tip from Marty's mom leads to a stunning twist in the case that no one saw coming. He was shocked when we showed up at his front door. For several tense days, it wasn't clear if Marty Hill would live or die. In those same days, it also wasn't clear just exactly who tried to kill her. Michelle Sagona is back with today's story, The Devil You Know. When cops in Prairie Village, Kansas, found Marty Hill beaten and stabbed in the basement of her own home, they were in shock. It was the worst crime scene that I'd ever been involved in. Doctors aren't sure she'll survive. Her injuries, so extensive, her own family wasn't sure it was her. When I walked into the room, I saw her in front of me. My first reaction was, 
kind of fell to the ground. The only thing I could really recognize on her was her hands. It's like blood creeping out of one of her eyes, besides the swelling in her face. So it was really hard to watch. I was just in shock. Marty was unconscious, and detectives knew they'd have to find a suspect without any help from their victim. Have there been other attacks like this in your area? No, there had not. So you were starting at ground zero? We were. Sergeant Luke Roth and Detective Jason Wakefield were assigned as lead investigators on the case. No sexual assault. There wasn't a robbery. No forced entry. Who are you thinking could have done this to her? Initially, it was the ex-husband or a boyfriend that nobody knew about. Marty had been divorced from Steve Hill for seven years, but the two were in constant contact because they share custody of daughter Mackenzie. She'd have Mackenzie on the weekends and I'd have it during the week. So I saw Marty pretty regularly. On the day of the attack, Steve had been trying to reach his daughter after school, but his calls were going unanswered. I was getting a little frustrated with her because I kind of thought she was, you know, dodging her dad. It wasn't until late that evening that he learned what had happened. Who told you? The Prairie Village Police Department. Cops called to say his ex-wife had been attacked and he was a person of interest. Being the ex-husband that I've watched enough television shows, I knew that they were coming to question me and I, I didn't know the severity. I had no idea what had happened to her other than she'd been attacked in her home. But Steve wasn't told how dire the situation actually was. You had no idea that she was likely about to die. No. When cops came knocking at his door, Steve was more than happy to cooperate. He did everything we asked. The best way to put it is he wanted to find out who did this just as much as we did. Steve had an alibi for that morning. He told cops he brought his daughter to school, then he went to work. Before leaving, officers got a DNA sample. They wanted to scrape underneath my fingernails and take hair follicle samples and all that stuff. So, you allowed yeah, them to do all of course. that? Of course. But until the DNA results came back and his alibi could be confirmed, Steve wasn't even allowed to see his daughter. I couldn't get my daughter uh, after school. They basically wanted to keep her away from me until they had eliminated me as a suspect. To daughter Mackenzie, who was 15 years old at the time, it didn't make any sense. I knew that he would never do anything like this to her, so that was really hard for me to understand at the time. But like police, Marty's son, Stephen Kirby, thought everyone in his mom's life should be considered a suspect, even the man he once called stepdad. In my head, he was a suspect, but he wasn't my number one. I, I felt like we were after somebody else. And the same question lingered. Who would want to kill Marty Hill? Her family, friends, and co-workers had no idea. Did you know if she had any enemies? Oh, never. I can't even imagine in a million years that someone would. But later that night, after detectives left Steve's house, a strange thought surfaced. I just remembered somebody told me that she had had somebody working on her house. So I tried to call one of the detectives, and I ended up getting a voicemail on his cell phone, and I just left him a message. Marty's mom, Shirley Roth, had already told cops about the handyman. She's the one who recommended Brian Pennington to her daughter after he did work on her own home. It was stucco in the house, and he was just fine. He did a really nice job. He became a friend of ours. Shirley hoped maybe Brian had seen something suspicious while working at her daughter's home, something that could help with the investigation. So right away, I looked at my phone and gave him Brian's telephone number. Him being Sergeant Roth. Well, that was another person for you to look at. Quite honestly, we were looking to see if he might have seen anybody at the house that was staying with Marty, that she may have been dating, that she may have been in communication with, because we had nothing to go with. Detective Jason Wakefield first reached Brian Pennington by phone. You call this person, and he agrees to meet with you. He did. It's a good sign. He invited us to his house. Two days after the brutal attack left Marty Hill at death's door, Detective Wakefield and Sergeant Roth head to the home of her handyman. Their entire 90-minute conversation with the father of two was recorded. What did you think when you heard that Marty got attacked? 
I really didn't know what to think. She's a really, really decent lady. But even before going inside, a red truck in Brian's driveway sparks suspicion. Did you ever drive that red one at all? No. The day of the attack, Marty's neighbor told cops she'd seen a beat up red truck on their street. She said she saw this truck around eight o'clock in the morning and it was being driven by a white male of smaller stature. Then another red flag, scratches on the handyman's face. He told me they were from a pit bull. When I looked at him, it didn't appear they were dog scratches. It appeared they were more fingernail type scratches. Detectives asked Brian if he had been back to Marty's house since finishing the work two weeks earlier. He claimed that would have been impossible. I'm so far in debt right now, I can't even afford to go to the gas station, really. The entire time he talked about his financial struggles, where there was no way he could have drove to Prairie Village, Kansas, an hour and a half away. His wife, Jessica, corroborated his alibi. She said he was home all night with her. With so much blood in Marty's basement, detectives were sure any suspect would have blood evidence on their clothes. Hey, Brian, do you, you don't have any cl clothes with any blood on them or anything like that, do you? No? You mind if I take a look real quick? Is that all right with you? Okay. Brian agrees to let detectives search through the laundry hamper. We had uh, recovered a pair of jeans that had red stains that we could see on the hems and within the thigh portions. But the handyman had an explanation. You know what this stuff is on the bottom? Grease. Grease? Something. Um, not blood though, right? No. By now, cops weren't buying it. Brian had quickly become their prime suspect. But could they push him to confess? There's just so much evidence. I mean, it's overwhelming. Somebody's going to get caught for this. There's no doubt in my mind, absolutely zero doubt. We just have to figure out why this happened. What do you want to tell us, Brian? Well, I don't know Before leaving, detectives ask if they can take Brian's stained jeans. You mind if I take these? That's all right. Okay. When you left his house that night and you were in the car on the way back, what was that conversation like with your partner? We were shocked. We went to this house with the thought process that Brian might lead us to whoever was responsible. We now left the house thinking there was a good chance Brian was responsible and that we might have a key piece of evidence that could solve that. Investigators deliver the genes to the Johnson County Crime Lab. That very night, preliminary tests confirmed the stains are human blood. The next day, more confirmations. The blood matches Marty Hill. Cops were close to making an arrest, but before they pounced, Marty's family had some even bigger news to share. We got a phone call that Marty had started talking. Up next, beaten, stabbed, and left to die, Marty Hill defies the odds. They all called her Miracle Marty. Not only did she survive, Marty is naming her attacker. She's telling her harrowing story to Crime Watch Daily, and you won't believe what else she reveals. Now to the conclusion of today's story, The Devil You Know. Here's Michelle Sagona. Chris, they are often some of our most compelling interviews. People who narrowly escape a nightmare and live to tell their survival story. No one expected her to live. But three days after Marty Hill was beaten and stabbed inside her Kansas home, the single mother started talking for the first time. Her friends and family were ecstatic, but Marty doesn't remember any of it. The first memory you have is waking up in the hospital and seeing your dad. Yes. That was 12 days after the attack, which happened just before she headed to work. Talk to me about that morning. You were getting ready to leave for work. So um, I heard something and kind of looked out the front window. Brian Pennington was at the door, a handyman who'd completed work inside her home two weeks earlier. I think I was kind of wondering why he would be there in the area that early. That's because she knew Brian lived 90 minutes away in Leeton, Missouri. I'm thinking maybe he had a, another job in the area. Marty was considering selling her home at the time, and Brian said there was something in the basement he wanted to show her that needed to be fixed. 
so she invited him inside. Before they reached the basement, she noticed something was odd. I remember talking, and I don't exactly know what I was saying or asking him. I'm feeling like he's, he's not answering or he's not saying anything. Like You were walking down ahead to, of him? Yes, yeah, so I'm ahead of him. And then two steps away from the stairs, I kind of look to see, you know, why he's not responding or saying anything. At the same time, he grabs my neck. Um, I just remember him holding so very tight, and when I'm trying to look, he was uh, away from me, which it just all seemed so odd. He was, and it was just getting tighter, and I kept saying, why, what are you doing? And I don't understand, what are you doing? Marty felt her voice get weak just before she passed out. At this point, you're on the ground in your basement. Do you remember anything after that? I then remember waking I'm against something and my back is hurting and I'm trying to get back up and get balanced and just still fighting and fighting and kicking and, and asking him to leave and what are you doing and just so puzzled and still so confused. You know, I, I just, it was all happening so fast. After that, I remember nothing. Nothing at all. Nope. When he was done, Marty had several fractures to her skull, face, and a severe brain concussion. She also had four quarter inch deep, six long stab wounds in the neck. So the way that he cut her neck um, had missed the carotid artery, and if he would have been just millimeters away, she would have bled out. About four hours after the attack, Marty's boss was at her doorstep. Could you hear anyone knocking on the door? When she wouldn't answer the door, her co-workers called police. Can you say her truck is there? Her truck's there. She's not called in. She's not returning her phone calls. And she's single. Had her co-workers not followed their gut instinct and called police, Marty likely wouldn't be here today. Well, they saved her life. I don't think she had much more time to lay on that basement floor. Do you think of them as your angels that day? I definitely... Definitely do. I mean, I definitely would have been there for them. I feel like there's a huge lesson in all of that. I think that's important to make sure you're being respectful to your, your other coworkers, and, um, and I think that that will be given back to you. Three days after the attack, with her eyes still swollen shut, Marty started to speak. And the first thing she said was her attacker's name. When she was saying his name, it was very, it was shocking. Kind of understand that um, I was just doing whatever I could to get that out. I was mumbling it out. And I'm so proud that she could say that at, at so soon. The same day, cops also identified Brian Pennington as the suspect after blood found on his jeans matched Marty's. It was information they didn't want anyone to know, including her family. We did not want to cloud anybody's responses or feed anybody's information. They also wanted to gather more evidence before taking Brian into custody, which happened two days later. We actually saw him driving down the highway. Jessica was driving. He was seated in the passenger seat, and we actually did a car stop on the highway and took him into custody. Was he surprised? No. Marty's family and the entire community were relieved, especially her mother, who had referred Brian to Marty. That was great, but we were still, like, stressed about Marty's situation. Doctors were now cautiously optimistic that Marty would pull through, but the road to recovery wouldn't be easy. We didn't really know the extent of the injuries. We didn't know exactly what was going to heal all the way and, you know, if she would ever be her normal self again. In the beginning, even the most simple things were difficult for Marty to do. Her eyes were completely swollen shut, so in order for her to look at my brother and I, she would just hold her eye open. Once the swelling went down, she still had trouble seeing. I specifically remember them asking me to walk down a line, and I, my response was, which line? I was seeing two, and there was one. She also had to learn to walk again. Balance was a big issue for a long time. I remember we would put a harness on her and I would hold the back of it while she would kind of balance back and forth and walk down the hallways. Marty was hospitalized for nearly a month and after her release required around the clock care. 
I know that I would have been there for them. But you never, you don't always get that opportunity to see who's going to just really show up and be there. And it's had a lot of people. After years of rehabilitation, Marty still has trouble hearing out of one ear. It echoes when I talk. And they actually said I'd get used to that, but that has not happened. She says getting back to the gym was a big part of her recovery. I lost a lot of strength and just um, finally getting back to where I was working out, doing what I had done before, um, just made a big difference. Marty would need her strength to face her attacker in court. Brian Pennington was ultimately charged with attempted first degree murder and aggravated burglary. Prosecutors say he had a long rap sheet. He had 26 prior convictions. Those types of crimes were domestic violence. They were also crimes of dishonesty, burglaries, and thefts. He just seemed to be a very short-tempered individual. In addition to jeans with Marty's blood on them, Brian's cell phone also tied him to the attack. His wife texted him at, I think it was approximately 7.59 a.m. to ask where he was located. The cell phone information provided a tower location in next to Marty's house. The text also blew his alibi, proving that he wasn't home the morning of the attack, like Jessica first told cops. I think she gave that information to protect herself and her children. He had been physically abusive to her. Do you think she was afraid for her own safety? Absolutely. When she found out what he had done to Marty was when she was done protecting him. Brian Pennington eventually pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 28 years in prison. You had to face your attacker in court. What was that like for you? Oh, gosh. Mostly just the flooding of why, and I just don't understand. And you're not the person I thought you were. Brian never offered an apology or an explanation for the attack. I probably will never know. There's not going to be a, a good answer. Marty is now focused on using her experience to help others. She talks to groups about how to stay safe and how to get through traumatic events. She also recently started writing a book. I feel like that is such a gap in my life. I just, I think by putting every detail down and walking through it, it becomes where I, I know it and I understand it. I asked Marty if there was one thing she could say to Brian, what it would be. I don't think I have anything to say to him. But is there any part of you that can ever forgive this man for what he took from you? I feel like it would only be hurting me to not forgive him. I think it wouldn't affect him, really. I think it makes my life different to be able to forgive and move on and be stronger. Hard to imagine Marty Hill becoming any stronger than she already is. You are an inspiration to me and to everyone at Crime Watch Daily, and it really is an honor to sit across from you. Thank you. And Marty promises she'll be at every parole hearing Pennington will have during his 28-year sentence to make sure he can't do this to someone else. Coming up... It's been a bumpy road. A police officer's battle with cancer doesn't stop him from jumping into action during Hurricane Harvey. These children you saved, they're now here, and you helped keep them from drowning. This incredible story of heroism, that's next. We're back now with more of today's Crime Watch Daily, and in our next story, we're honoring a true hero. Nurissa Knight is in Texas with the latest recipient of our badge of honor. Chris, here on Crime Watch Daily, we travel the country, often telling stories of terrible tragedies or heartbreaking mysteries. Well, today, we're looking at the other side of crime, the heroes who are on the front lines making a difference. Hurricane Harvey. Well, the people come out the sky now. Devastating. A catastrophic event of epic proportions that pummeled Houston. Trying to get to safety. It touches you to the core. A natural disaster that inspired supernatural acts of heroism. There were tons and tons of people helping everybody. It was, it was good to see everybody come together. But there is one hero who was not just battling the deadly hurricane, he was also battling his own deadly terminal illness. He could have retired right after he had his diagnosis, but he's chosen to keep working 
and keep doing what he loves, which is being a police officer. Norbert Ramon, a 24-year veteran of the Houston Police Department, has a passion for his job. And as a patrolman, he saw plenty of action. What's your favorite thing about being a police officer? It's not routine. It's different every day, you know, so you could be in a hell storm one day or, you know, you can meet all kinds of people. There's always a different challenge. Right. But one day will forever be seared in the mind of Officer Ramon, the day he was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. It's been a bumpy road. Ramon got the devastating diagnosis after a routine colonoscopy. But I had no symptoms. I mean, I was in and out. I was in the best shape of my life, running, jog, you know, just doing everything, lost all this weight. This just came out of nowhere. You right. were feeling good and right. healthy. Never sick at all. In a one-two punch, the doctors delivered the news nobody wants to hear, a death sentence. Officer Ramon had only two to five years to live. It hits you like a ton of bricks. The dad and grandfather of three was pulled from patrol and placed on desk duty while he underwent chemotherapy every two weeks. And they immediately started me on chemo after that, so I was getting a lot of uh, pains in my stomach. It almost, I almost keeled over. But when Hurricane Harvey hit, so did the brave call of duty. I don't sit here and dwell on my cancer. The only time it hits me is when I go to the doctor and, and reality hits me again. With the floodwaters rising, Officer Ramon forgot his own troubles and plunged into action. He couldn't make it to headquarters, so he reported to a nearby station, Houston PD's Lake Patrol. So when I showed up to work Saturday morning, he was already here. He actually beat me here. Sergeant Epi Garza has worked alongside Officer Ramon for 15 years. He was thrilled to see his longtime buddy turn up to lend a hand. I knew this was going to be serious, and I could use all the help I could need, especially with officers who got experience like himself in boating. But Sergeant Garza knew he had to keep his good friend from getting in over his head, since he was the only other person who knew about Officer Ramon's cancer battle. And I briefed everybody, and I briefed him to the side, and we talked. I'm like, hey, just let me know how you feel. If you need to take a break or if you need to rest or, you know, in other words, I want to give him special treatment, but he's not that type. He doesn't want it. He, if everybody else is out there working, guess what? He's going to be out there working, too. No, he's not. In fact, even working round the clock for days, none of the other cops had any clue Ramon was facing a terminal condition. Somebody had to tell me he had cancer. I didn't even know. He made the rest of us feel like uh, we needed to step up our game a little bit. Ramon and the patrol team braved the rising floodwaters tirelessly rescuing trapped and desperate people on boats packed beyond capacity. Right now, it's just us, and we've got all the room in the world. But when you were on this boat during Hurricane Harvey, what did it look like? What did it feel like oh, here? Oh, this whole deck was covered with people. Her hair, in the back, size, many as we could put on. You saved children from second-story apartments? Yeah, Everyone? where I had to stand on the top and had to reach, and, you know, reach as far as I can, and then they'd hand them to me. The babies. Uh, yeah, the babies and stuff, and i set them down, and then... And then some adults are trying <laughs> to climb up. I'm like, oh my God. But Officer Ramon is quick to point out he was only a small part of the rescue effort. Many officers risked it all to save the stranded. In fact, some of his brothers in blue actually had to be snatched from the raging waters themselves. But it wasn't just rising floodwaters that posed a danger to Officer Ramon. The toxins in the water posed an added danger in his weakened condition. What do you think your doctors would have said if they'd known what you were doing? <laughs> At first, they're like, "Is he's crazy. What's he doing out there? It's muddy. There's debris. There are chemicals. Yeah, there are toxins in that water. And bugs, you know, just everything, you know, so just... But you didn't think about that? No, no. Even with all the devastation, Ramon says there were bright spots thanks to his fellow comrades. They say you were the Energizer Bunny, though. You were just nonstop. You were going and going. You were just 
full of energy and vitality. And when you work with these guys and they joke around like that, you know, they keep you going. The guys around here are clowns. I mean, they keep you laughing. There's never a dull moment. And of course, a superfood that's been one of Officer Ramon's secret weapons for all these years. How did you get the strength with stage four cancer? Where did your strength come from? I guess all the donuts they brought us here over. <laughs> the donuts. Oh, we didn't get no food. That's all the, the local community. It was so funny. I've never seen so many donuts before in my life. All joking aside, eventually the team got wind of Ramon's grave condition. We actually slept here at the station. Well, I was the only one that knew about his diagnosis. And one night, you know, all the guys are fixing to go to bed, and one of the guys goes, hey, uh, I don't want to get in Officer Ramon's business, but have you seen him? Have you seen his feet? Something's wrong with him. Well, because of the, of the treatments that he takes because of chemo, it makes his feet turn colors. I had to tell him the truth of what his diagnosis was, and they were just all amazed. Officer Ramon didn't complain, not for a single second. And after saving all those lives, he still had to save himself. With the airports closed, he then drove through the wreckage to Oklahoma for his own treatments. You save people, and then is immediately after saving people, you went for chemo treatment. Mm -hmm. Wow. Officer Ramon has lived for two years with stage four colon cancer. He battles every morning for one more day. And there are at least 1,600 people who are here because of his courage. We hear that he saved 1,500 people. And that number actually is probably on the low end. But I've always said to me what's the most remarkable is just him just doing it and not complaining and not being one to be treated anything special. And when the floodwaters finally cleared, the man who helped save more than 1,500 lives still refuses to take credit for his heroism. Because of your heroics, there are generations who will still be around because you didn't give up even though you have cancer. Do you feel like you're a hero? We do. Oh, I, I know everybody called I I just can't accept it. I mean, I was just out there working, to, doing what, what we do regardless, you know. I just mean, I consider every officer out there working, you know, they're all heroes to me. Up next, Officer Ramon and his wife Cindy join me here at Crime Watch Daily with an update on his health, and we've got a huge surprise for them. That's next. Houston police officer Norbert Ramon was not alone when he rescued more than 1,500 people during Hurricane Harvey. However, Officer Ramon's story is quite unique. That's because along with battling the rising floodwaters, he was battling an aggressive form of cancer. And right now, I'm honored to be joined by this brave officer. Thanks for being here. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. How is the battle against cancer going? It's going good. I mean, I try not to dwell on it. I try just to keep my life normal, stay busy, do a lot of uh, recreational activities, keep my mind free. What was it like being in that situation? That had to be overwhelming. The first day we went out, we had a lot of children and families that we rescued, and that was all day, eight or nine hours, just back and forth, back and forth. Well, I want to bring in someone who obviously is very supportive of you, your wife, Cindy. Cindy, come on in here. Thanks for being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. What did you think when you said he was going to work with all these things going on with his health? Well, that's a huge concern of mine, of course, because he is battling stage four colon cancer and it's an aggressive form of cancer. All I was doing just praying, I said, God, please keep this man safe, keep him healthy. I knew he was gonna be out there doing what he loves to do, helping people. Tell me one thing about your husband that no one else knows. He's a big teddy bear. He might put on this front that he's big burly, mean to tough guy, guy but cop. he's a sweetheart well your actions that day did not just touch the people of houston they touch us here at crime watch daily and right now we would like to award you with our special badge of honor it's a little title we reserve for those who go above and beyond the call of duty and you certainly deserve it and here is a <laughs> check for five thousand oh dollars uh, so which much. is made out to the assist the officer foundation in texas it's a great organization one we're very fond of and there's something else. They told us that they're going to award this to you guys. So it's yours to help in your battle oh, and wow. your struggle and everything you've got going on in life. Oh, thank you guys. It is the very least we could do, and God bless. And we wish you nothing but Godspeed oh, and good thank health. Thank you so much. I mean, I believe in prayers, and thank you for everything.